Hello. All right, everyone, thank you for joining once again. You're welcome to today's class. Good evening to you all. How has been our classes and lectures? Uh, this week marks, uh, and today specifically marks the end of uh, this class. And this is the fourth contact we are having. I've been going through our assignments, uh, you know, so far. Uh, and I want to believe we are fine and we are safe where we are. Okay, so please keep um, practicing the requirements of um, safety. All right, now we have a lot, uh, relatively much to cover, and today being the last class, so uh, I'll run through what we have for today, after which I'll just take out five minutes to do a brief review of all that we have uh, talked about. All right, so today we're going to be going straight to staff administration. So we're looking at the importance of an office, how to set an office, the responsibilities of an office staff and what to look out for when setting up an office. So we're going to go to staff administration uh, this evening, okay? Staff administration. So we say staff administration is one of the personnel management function that has to do with management, okay? Ex managing existing and incoming potential staff in the organization. Of course, when you have an office and you have a place, uh, you're going to have people that are going to work with you called staff. So how to effectively manage this staff? So staff administration is an aspect of personnel management uh, that cannot be treated in isolation, okay? Uh, it is worth noting that no organization survives without the human factor, without the human input. So this is where the responsibility of those that are within that office and all that they're supposed to do comes uh, you know, uh, on board. It is worth noting that no organization can survive without the human factor. And so uh, the importance of personnel or human resource can never be overemphasized. When you, you know, even if you have computers, no matter how automated you have made your system, you still need uh, the role of people. If you have a laptop, you still need somebody to, to control it, to uh, operate it. You have a, a device, you still need somebody to operate it. So the importance of personnel um, is very important. And for an organization to be relevant uh, among its contemporaries, it should be combined effectively and enhance considerably its workforce. Otherwise, they will migrate to elsewhere for greener pastures. Staff administration simply mean the process by which an organization, firm or company manages, okay, or efficiently and eff um, effectively uses the human resource or the staff, okay, in an efficient manner in order to achieve the goals of the organization. Let me read it again, or let me take it again. Staff administration simply means the process by which an organization, firm or company manages its members of staff in the most efficient and effective manner uh, in order to achieve the organizational goal. So please don't forget that, uh, that definition. And let's, let's quickly go to personnel management. We said uh, several definitions have evolved to understand what personnel management means. So I'll just speak it, I'll just speak two out of them. Now, uh, aptly by in uh, 1982, says that personnel management is a process of management that is concerned with the maintenance of the human relationship and ensuring the well-being of employees, you know, so that they can efficiently give, do their best at work. So he said, now the key points to note in this definition is what is the maintenance of human relationship by ensuring that the physical well-being of employees, you know, are, is giving maximum contribution, okay, so that at the, at what the organization stands for can be realized. That is um, the first definition. The second definition is by Crane in 1980, and it says personnel administration is a process of supporting the attainment of organizational objectives by continually acquiring developing and efficiently utilizing resources within the organization. So majorly the thing to understand about personnel management is the human aspect, the human entity, the staff, the people. How do you effectively manage them with respect to what they are supposed to do so that the organizational objectives can be 
realized. Now, the Institute of Personnel Management in London sees personnel management as that part of management that is concerned with people at work and their relationship with the organization. So the people and the relationship, said in other words, the students and the school. Okay, so it's that kind of relationship that exists that we call personnel management. Okay, so personnel management has been interchangeably used, you know, with terms like manpower management, human resource management, personnel administration. Now, all characterize human factor actually. Okay, but they all have their distinct uh, roles to play. In fact, previously we used to have personnel management, and more recently, human resource management is used and not so much of personnel management, but within the office space, personnel management is still very, very important. So from all the definitions, four things cannot be ignored. First of all, we have to acquire the acquisition of people, the acquisition of the human resource. Secondly, we have to integrate people, okay, within the organization. Thirdly, we have to develop, and lastly, we have to motivate them. Note these four points as a summary of things that have to come out in all of these definitions. They have to be the acquisition of people as acquiring, then integrating people. How do they fit into that system? What will be their work, their responsibility? Then into, um, that's then developing, developing the organization. And lastly, how you know they can be motivated. All these four factors uh, play an important role as summary in what personnel management all, uh, is all about. So, Let's look at the functions of a personnel because don't forget this course is ICT office and my office management. So how do you, what, what should be your responsibility as a personnel manager? First of all, staffing activities, which has to do with recruitment, selection and placement. Three words that go hand in hand, recruitment, bringing in staff, selection, uh, recruitment, placing advice for people to ad apply. Selection is, okay, you're qualified, we need you. Placement is giving them the various positions that they are going to operate within that place. The next responsibility of personnel management is wages and salaries. Okay, so you have to pay workers as they do their work. That is where wages, wages and salaries come in and factors have to be considered to determine their wages and salaries, like their experience, their skills and all of that. The next thing is training and development. There must be rooms for every worker to be trained, to be built, to be developed, to be improved so that they can continually give their best. The fourth thing is discipline. There has to be discipline, rules and regulation, codes of conduct. How do we do things? How do, how do we operate here? This is where uh, discipline comes in. Okay, then employee welfare. How are the staff doing? Are they well? Are they okay? Are they being provided for? Do they have all that they need? Okay, are they meeting? Uh, is, is there health coverage? Uh, is there hazard coverage? Uh, are there other allowances? that can aid them. So welfare of staff, if, if a staff gives birth, what is what is the plan for them? If they, if a staff is sick, what is, if a staff dies, is there any compensation for family? All these are what we call well, employee welfare. Then also the responsibility extends to performance appraisal. Appraisal has to do with uh, looking at the progress, the progress of work of staff, how they are doing, how they are improving, how they are growing, and how they are producing and generating results, results, is what, uh, you know, in, in the progress of their work is what is called performance appraisal. Then we have industrial labor relations. This is uh, linked to services like labor unions. If the workers have a challenge, they can report the workers. Uh, okay, so here is the organization on one side. On the other side, you have the workers. And all the workers cannot just go and meet uh, the organization to table any challenge. So they go through the unions. They go through, uh, you know, the labor unions. So just like Nigerian Labor Congress speaks on behalf of every worker in Nigeria. So that is what it represents. So it's also that liaison between the organization and the labor unions. Then also promotion transfers, health and safety function, and also planning. So these are the functions of personnel management now going to recruitment of human resources let's look at recruitment 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 um don't forget i said i'm going to be very fast because we today is our last day and we have a short time and i want to believe the network is clear enough and you can hear me okay now uh in 1975 onigoje refined uh staff recruitment as um, the means of getting the kind of people that you want the kind of staff that you want to work, uh, you know, in your organization, okay? And organizations or firms employ people because they meet the requirements for a position. Now, there are two sources of recruitment, okay? You could recruit internally 
and you recruit externally. So we have internal sources of recruitment and what we call external sources of recruitment. Internal sources of recruitment and external sources of recruitment. Okay, now internal sources of recruitment are when, when there's a vacant position and you promote somebody or you upgrade someone or you transfer somebody because there's an opening. It's called internal source of recruitment because you're getting the staff still from within the organization, okay? Or um, when somebody is on a leave without pay, it's a system, maybe somebody uh, loses his job by or downsized by a system called leave without pay and you recall them, okay? Or ex and employee that is leaving and you retain them based on contracts, you know? And all of these systems, uh, or when you have management trainees or apprentices or contractors that are now permanented, all these are what we call the internal sources of recruitment, okay? And the advantage is that it boosts morale of workers in the organization and it enables management to evaluate their work more closely. Okay, then it, it promotes, it helps loyalty because people know that, uh, you know, since uh, opportunities open up within and uh, workers are sourced from within, it's going to breed loyalty and, you know, people will be very much more committed to their work. But the only, one of the challenges that, you know, you could have things like favoritism and nepotism because when you work within a system, you get to know people over time, you get to develop kind of association and relationships with people. And so you could be favored in a way, not favored, sorry, that's not the right word. You could be, uh, you could be, uh, you could be um there could be partiality in in that you could be given a post that you necessarily do not deserve why because of association or you know somebody and you might not be deserving for it okay uh you know and those that are that, that deserve the positions might not get it okay so these are some of the challenges of internal recruitment okay then new motivation and new ideas do not come in because you are recycling the same people and you're not allowing for irrigation between uh, those that come from that would have come from outside with their own new ideas so you, it's left internally uh, then we have second form of recruitment which is external sources of recruitment uh, and from external sources of recruitment you have um like uh, educational schools such as polytechnics and universities hiring people government agencies referrals private consultants professional bodies newspaper journals unsolicited applications and all of that so it's an external recruitment you are not getting your staff from within that system and it has so many advantages because it gives room for diversity okay it removes possibilities of uh, unfairness it removes possibilities of um, uh, nepotism and favoritism and it gives availability for healthy competition okay and it also gives opportunity for people to come in with um you know different ideas there's an irrigation of knowledge and ideas however the only disadvantage is that when you keep bringing people from outside and neglect those that are within they do not feel uh that level of commitment and uh they do not feel um that level of loyalty as if they are being considered so much okay so it can affect loyalty and it is very time consuming to bring people outside and lastly the uh, it costs a lot because you will have to train them so these are some of the challenges of having external uh recruitment okay so let's move on very quickly um we are progressing so uh, after recruitment is is selection process um and select the opportunity okay uh, selection is concerned with the activities all activities employed to determine candidates who have the highest probabilities of getting it so selection process uh, uh selection as a process of choosing people for the available job in an organization at a particular point in time with the aim of gathering information about the candidate or job uh, applicant so uh, we're talking about what staff selection process how do you select okay and um, to you have to evaluate you have to evaluate these candidates okay you have to evaluate them by kind of screening of applicants you have to screen them to see if they are qualified and if they have the requirement for that job so uh, well, let us look at the, st the steps in selection what are the steps you carry out in selecting first of all you have to shortlist by doing a preliminary okay then of course they have applied and they might go through a series of tests after tests those that passed are uh, you know 
are, are separated from those that do not fail, then you, they, those that pass go through an interview stage. After interview, the interview is when, okay, uh, we are likely to pick you, but we need to meet with you. After that interview, you carry out background checks and verification of all that they say they have. They have done this, they have done that, I've worked here, I've worked there, I, I graduated with a first class from this school. So these are where you do your background checks and probably other things like checking for their physical, if they are fit, medical, then lastly, you offer employment to those that have lastly been given that opportunity then carried out induction. So having known that, how do you carry out interview? The interview is a very sensitive part of recruitment in, uh, because that is where you get to <clears throat> determine outside exam writing and all that, which, is, which can be part of an interview. Uh, you want to also determine more closely how how you can meet people and get to do the hand picking or the selection for, for the final process. So we have different types of interviews. We have a direct interview. This is where you meet with the people. Okay, we sometimes call it a minor interview. Uh, you know, you have people, you could have a panel, you get to meet with people, you ask them questions about, you know, what they have written in their CVs and resumes. Okay, it's mainly, you know, for lower level jobs. You can, for, you can carry out direct interview to meet you. Then we have structured interview. Now in the structured approach, interviews determine uh, in advance the questions and their sequence using the analysis of the job requirements. So you know the job that is required and you carry out an interview, uh, what is required on the job, I beg your pardon, what is called the job description. Then you carry out an interview with respect to what is required. So structured interviews are more appropriate for mid-level, those that are coming to you know, mid-level position, not necessarily the top echelon, but mid-level position. You can use structured uh, interview. Then we have unstructured interview. Okay, or otherwise it's non-direct. The first one is direct, second is, is structured. Then we could have an interview that is non-structured. And in this type, the interviewers, they do not have any plan strategy. They do not have any particular system. They are open-minded. They just want to meet with them. Uh, you know, the, the prospective employees. So they get to meet to them, ask them general questions as they desire. Okay, interviewers must be experienced in interviewing uh, methods to glean sufficient data. So you can ask any form of question, unlike structure that you're, you're very specific with the kind of question you ask that is largely related to the job alone. Then we have one that's called stress interview. There are certain jobs that will require you to subject them um, the prospective employees under certain conditions to see how their responses. In this interview, we normally use to test the perseverance level of applicants, okay? You could delay them, you could test their patience, uh, you could make them afraid to see how they could respond. Certain jobs might require that level of what interview, if you're working anything military, paramilitary, they do a lot of stress interviews, okay? Uh, you castigate, you, you know, all sorts of things, test their temperamental level, uh, all of those the interviews put candidates on the defensive by being aggressive okay to see how you can respond under uh, stress so these interviews are very very important and they help us to be able to determine more closely more closely these candidates and all they have if they are um you know qualified for this job that uh, uh you have selected them for Okay. okay, so the next one is, um, so we have importance of interviews, I've already talked about some of them. Uh, then assessment method, if you're assessing, you should look at, um, you know, several things in an interview. Look at how their physical makeup is, how they look, are they well dressed? Look at their, what have they have attained in terms of both knowledge and education. Look at you know, other qualities, look at their intelligence, their interest in terms of sociality. Look at their disposition, okay? How do they relate? How do they talk? How what is their influence, circumstance, and other domestic things? So mm -hmm. the next thing uh, apart from carrying out interview are tests. We're looking at the various elements that are that are looked at in an interview. We also carry out tests. We have classified tests, um uh, classification of tests, which we have mental ability tests. You want to test the mental strength and ability. You have aptitude tests, which can be general questions or special aptitude tests. You have achievement. You want to test their proficiency, like typing skills, for instance. You want to take, test how many letters you can type in, in five minutes, okay? Interest test. You want to check uh, your vocational test, okay? All these things are various types of tests that can um, be used, okay? And so the last aspect of this course, after looking at all the elements that are 
in dealing with personnel and an office is um, is to is talk about accounting and bookkeeping. Accounting and bookkeeping. This is the last thing we're going to be discussing uh, in the next five minutes before I take the last three minutes to just review all that we have done. Okay, so bookkeeping and accounting uh, are separate functions, even though they are closely related. There are many fields that are related, but they are not the same. Okay, they are not the same, but they are related uh, in that they, they are their, their responsibilities kind of overlap and accounting and bookkeeping is one of them. And sometimes people even mistake one for the other, but they are actually different. So in simple terms, bookkeeping is responsible for recording financial transaction. Now you might just see that, okay, just basically recording financial transaction, but on a larger scale, you could be responsible for handling a lot of uh, hundreds and hundreds of transactions, big, big transactions that are being carried out on a daily basis, which is a lot of work, and you know how important finance is and in any entity. So a bookkeeper is majorly responsible for uh, you know, making documentation for all uh, financial transactions, whereas the accountant is responsible for, first of all, he has to interpret. I know that these things are not just done in a layman from where you just carry paper and say 10th of, 10th of uh, June 2020, uh, bought 10 cartons, this, number two no you don't do it in a very uh, unprofessional way there are professional ways of carrying out excellent bookkeeping standards so uh, uh so after carrying out that you have the accountant who comes to interpret who carries out classification and analyzes all these financials okay and tries to summarize this financial into their requirements you're going to be having big companies where people are buying stocks how do you manage such financial requirements and data? You're going to be having orders from both international and national listings. You're going to be having financials coming in in different um, uh, uh, currencies and could have uh, uh, Naira, you could have dollars, you could have Euro currencies, people carrying out transaction. And so you see that the work of a bookkeeper to be able to manage the excellent financials, uh, you know, you're going to be paying staff, you're going to be having uh, what is called running costs, daily costs, and all of that different department are going to be requesting for uh, one thing or the other to be bought and all of that. So you see that uh, the bookkeeping and accounting responsibility is actually a huge one. So let us look at a couple of things on how we can differentiate them. When it comes to the definition, we've already said the um, the, the bookkeeper is mainly re uh, responsible for recording transactions, whereby uh, the um, accountant, uh, accounting profession has um, it has to do with summarizing, interpreting, and communication these financial transactions in what we call ledger accounts. Okay, in ledger accounts, um, management can take decision based on the data that has been provided by the bookkeeper. But you see, depending on the data provided by the accountant, the manager can take critical business decisions. So you can just have a decision that is being written on all the books, but the is the accountant that will now interpret the responsibility of those decisions with respect to the financial strength of the company. That's very, very key and important. Uh, the bookkeeper carries out records of all financial transactions in a systematic and proper way, whereby the accountant is able to gauge the financial situation and communicate it to other relevant authorities. If they're having meetings, uh, the accountant has to always be there to analyze. And you know, that when we have two different types of, um, uh, what was the name? To them, two different types of uh, bookkeeping, single entry and double entry bookkeeping. But for the sake of this course, we're not going to those uh, uh, details, okay? So you could actually go into a more um, detail study to understand and if you want to become a bookkeeper and accountant. But it's important to say that the, um, the fields of bookkeeping and accounting are changing very, very seriously. In fact, it is projected that in the next few years, responsibilities like bookkeeping will not even be relevant again at all. We will not need bookkeepers. Why? Because of accounting software that have been designed to manage all of this. So just with uh, somebody buying a, uh, which are already even in place now, not even a few years time, there are many places where you don't even need uh, bookkeepers again. Why? Because just by put, put, push, up, push up a button, Everything has been programmed. When sales are made at the end of the year, at the end of the day, uh, sorry, uh, month or week, for instance, depending on the system that is being used, you can have a detailed 
printout of all financial transactions. Detailed printout, and so the responsibility of the, of the bookkeeper is not necessarily, beg your pardon, that relevant as time goes on. Again, so these are few that are uh, gradually facing out and is being replaced with um, more recent technologies. Okay, so, uh, and this marks the end of our course, and I'll just quickly review all that we did. Sorry, today I had to rush a bit so, so that, um, you know, I wanted us to finish to be able to touch all that was um, required of us. Okay, so let me just um, go back to where we started. So we started with um, um, which, uh, English and communication skills, self-introduction, uh, and you know, introducing, introducing oneself in both self and career. Uh, we looked at all of that. We looked at English etiquettes like greeting, how to introduce oneself, uh, how to compliment. We looked at how to show gratitude and ap apologizing. We looked at how to give directions. Uh, we considered letter writing the various forms, both formal and informal, and also gave us an, uh, an assignment from here, which I've been marking. Uh, and I've seen some of us uh, have done well and some of us have did not really understand it. Please go back and read up properly. Then we looked at um, memo writing, how to write a memo. We said memo is used within an organization, okay? It's a formal document that is used in passing information. Uh, after that, we looked at resume in terms of how to carry out presentation, how to prepare a resume, and, and all of that that should be required. Then we looked at information technology, software, hardware, its relevance as an ICT and office staff. Uh, we looked at different types of computer network. We looked at the local area network, the uh, wide area network. We looked at we looked at the metropolitan area network. Okay, and we explained the basics of all of this. We looked at the internet. Okay, and we said that we have the intranet, we have the extranet, and we have what the internet. Okay, so we're able to examine uh, that as well. We explain um, them. We looked at email, uh, and we looked at the advantage of internet in terms of communication, information, entertainment. Uh, we looked at browser, uh, www, World Wide Web. We looked at the different types of internet connections. Okay, we looked at Google, Yahoo, MSN, and all of that, and we wrapped it up there. After that, we now went to look at, we look at, um, so looking at shorthand, we looked at uh, shorthand, and we saw how it's important in, um, okay, looked at different types of uh, systems of shorthand. We looked at stenography, stenography, which you said is um, having, using stenograph machines to uh, document when people are talking to get accurate record and data information. Okay, we looked at bookkeeping, we just finished that now, and I had to rush that so that uh, we can finish. After looking at bookkeeping, uh, we proceeded to talk about uh, uh, functions of office management. Office management, we looked at office management, and we said an office, uh, since the office management is, is similar to general administrative management, it performs the same functions. Uh, as are performed by management. So we looked at the responsibilities in an office management, we looked at planning, we looked at organizing, staffing, directing, we looked at leadership, okay? Then we looked at the modern office. Yes, I dwelt here a bit because of its relevance to the course. We looked at uh, the meaning of a, a modern office and we said the office is an administrative center of business, okay? After which we looked at office work, what is done in an office. We looked at all the activities that are done, processing of incoming mails, outgoing mails. We talked about um, transcription, typing, printing, copying, filing, document retrieval, and uh, you know record management. We looked at office locations. Now we said the functions of a, of a modern office can be classified into basic functions and what we call routine function. And I know I took my time that day to explain the difference between the two of them. I would say basic functions have to do with receiving and collecting information, arranging, processing, communicating the information, and the administrative functions of an office 
excuse me, has to do with planning, organizing, uh, staffing, directing, and managing uh, the general activities within that office. Okay. We, we were able to examine all of that. Then uh, we now proceeded to look at, uh, okay, I didn't talk about this that day, but I think they are just general questions, like review questions. What is an office responsibilities? Um, what is office work and all of that? Then we looked at factors that are used in selecting an office. What are the factors uh, that you, you should consider when selecting the location of an office? We said the nature of what you do or the nature of the business, you should consider that. We talked about nearness to the customers. Okay, you want to, and I, I, I give example that when you go to an institution, for instance, you see that um, there are a lot of photocopying machines, there are a lot of typewriters, I mean, um, you know, type uh, uh, and um, um, uh, you know, typing related jobs all around. For people want to type, uh, you know, they want to photocopy notes, projects, and all of that. A lot of papers flying here and there, generators everywhere. Why? Because uh, it's near to what a students require. Students require a lot of those services. Then, as nearness to related business, then availability of infrastructure, you should consider that availability of people to do the work and also the environment. You have to consider the safety, the security, then the cost of the space. And what are the laws? Are there any laws that guide getting, uh, you know, that is any physical conditions in an office? We said in official proper lightning, there should not be noise, uh, temperature, there should be cross ventilation, air quality should be very good and there should be places so people can sit down and furniture for storage, office cabinets, all those things must be there. Uh, and an office should be always clean because people will come, uh, you know, to carry out transactions. Then lastly, today we looked at staff administration, and I would say staff administration is a is a responsibility of um, one of the personnel management functions, and it's an aspect of personnel management which is very very important and has to do with what um, the people aspect, managing people and your staff within the organization. We talked about that and we said, uh, we defined it. Uh, one of the definitions I gave is that personal management is that part of the process of management that is concerned with the maintenance of human relationship and ensuring the physical well-being of employees that, uh, you know, that they give maximum and efficient, um, you know, efforts in achieving the, uh, reasons why that place was established okay so after looking at that we looked at uh, the responsibilities we said we summarized the definition of personal management into acquisition of people or staff integrating them within the organization developing what is done and of course creating motivation where people can continually give their best and work okay so we now proceed to talk about the office of um, sorry the functions of personal management we looked at uh, we said the responsibility has to do with staffing, looking at wages and salaries, training and development, discipline, employee welfare, performance, appraisal, industrial relations. And we talked about recruitment. We looked at the two uh, sources, of, uh, sources of recruitment. We said internal sources of recruitment and what external sources of recruitment. And I gave us the advantages and disadvantages of both. Then we looked at um, um, the process of selection or selecting staff. We looked at the process of staff selection, we mentioned all of that, and we talked about how to carry out interviews, the different types of interviews, direct, talked about, um, we talked about structured interview, unstructured interview, then stress uh, interview. We looked at all of this and how they are used and how they are applied. We said direct interview is when you relate with people directly and is used for majorly minors, even though it can be applied to others. Structure is when you ask definite questions. It's already planned out with respect to the job description. And structure is where you just ask general questions to get to know the persons and it must not be a specific line. Then stress interview is when you want to see how people behave on that certain conditions. So after interview, we now looked at tests. Okay, we looked at tests, classification of tests, mental ability, aptitude tests, achievement tests, and 
interest test. So that was where we wrapped it up. And uh, I want to congratulate you for being part of the class all through from the beginning up to this time. Uh, I want to believe it was very beneficial. Please, you have, have as I'm talking about listing all the topics on your own, you can go back and do uh, extra readings for anywhere that you do not understand. Meanwhile, don't forget to submit your assignments. Uh, and I told us to submit our assignments as an attachment, but many of us have been sending it direct. Please, for those of you that have not sum submitted, do it on Microsoft Word and send as an attachment to Nizelo, N-Y-I-Z-E-L-O, N-Y-I-Z-E-L-O, eight. Those that have already submitted to the other email, you don't need to worry, but if you've not submitted, it is N-Y-I-Z-E-L-O-8. That's Nizelo8 at gmail.com. N-Y-I-Z-E-L-O, Nizelo8 at gmail.com. So I wish you all the best. Please prepare very well for your exam, and uh, I wish you a wonderful week ahead. Thank you for being part of today's class. Uh, please do stay safe.